I find inspiration in the narrative, in the story that's being told, and how best I can convey that through purely visual elements. When I can't find the narrative is when I have trouble, but once I have it, my mind will go many places. I start pulling references for everything, even small stuff. Do a little bit of research here and there, but inspiration is manifested through figuring out what the story is in the particular art piece or picture. I just have to know what the story is. It's almost like a key where my imagination is locked. The narrative is the key that helps me find my inspiration. So in terms of doing the art, there's a handful of different steps. The first of which is figuring out the story, finding the narrative that I want to try to convey, and then what that will require. I start with a light sketch, very rough, scribbly lines, giving the barest of facsimile of person, pose, props, and when I feel like I've found something, something that when a viewer looks at it, they'll be able to infer the story. Taking very much cues off of show, don't tell. Trying to convey my story, my image's story, through elements on in the frame. Sometimes those require reference, so I'll go collect those. Once I have the references I need, I do a more refined sketch. Tighter lines, closer to final inks, but still loose enough to feel quick and like I haven't invested a whole lot of time and I can make changes still. It's all about building a foundation. Once I have the sketch done, once I have the foundation set up, wherein the composition is figured out, the flow of the viewer's eye drawing from one corner to the next and all over the canvas, then I move on to inks, wherein I try to apply a variation in the thickness of my line work. Things that are have a thin line to them are either lightweight, very sharp, or further away. Things with a thicker line are heavy, have a rounded edge, or are very close. And the way you apply these weights in different aspects and corners helps to inform the viewer as to what you are drawing. And that's not necessarily a language that people are cognizant of or aware that's happening when they look at a particular image and see how these line weights affect their perception of the image. Once the inks are done, I move on to the flat colors. Now the flat colors is among one of the most boring steps, and that might be the way that I choose to do it. But on the few occasions where I did decide to try to use a shortcut in terms of my process, I'm o I've almost always paid for it. Because later on, when it gets to the shading, I have to start making selections around things. And I'm not comfortable with just freehanding a selection. I mean, there are times when I will use a freehand lasso tool to make random selections, but those instances are few and far between. So laying down flats is fairly straightforward. It's just using the, the lasso tool to create a selection and then fill it with color and since it's all one block and none of it is anti-aliased, each pixel has an on or off state. Either the pixel has something in it or has nothing in it. There's no transparencies, which is often what you have with anti-aliasing, is it, it tries to use a smoothing technique to soften a line and make it look sharper instead of being subject to the blocky nature of a pixel. So when things look particularly jagged, like you can see the individual pixels, that is an aliased image. An anti-aliased image is where uh, the computer tries to mask or hide that jagged edge with le levels of transparencies, half pixels or half opacities that trick your eye into believing that the curve is smoother than it actually is, or that particular hard edge is smoother than it actually is. The shading part of my drawing process is nebulous. It's kind of fluid and goes back and forth between two major approaches. The first approach is cell shading, 
where I use a hard line to delineate a hard darker shape and shade of a given color to give the impression of form and how light interacts with that form. The other approach is through, I want to almost call it a dry brushing, but it's a careful application of lighter, a succeedingly lighter and lighter colors to give the impression of a more three-dimensional curved shape, complex curves. So like folds in clothing and individual hairs. However, that shading technique feels like it takes a long time. It can be quick depending on how complex a given image is, or I guess how simple a given image is. And in this more detailed shading style, I start with covering everything in shadow and then working on building up the highlights from a dark gray to a near white, either using an airbrush or a brush that lets me use transparencies. Usually using an air style brush, I can achieve that gradual increase in light as form begins to inform how a given figure occupies space. Once I've got the inks, the flat colors and the shading done, What's left after that is dependent on the art piece itself. Some pieces may require an additional highlights layer where I go in and add specular highlights for hard objects or things that have shiny reflections like eyes or glasses, bits of metal on the costuming and other layers containing special effects like smoke or special lighting, things that are going to interact with the character, stuff like rim light or backlighting, things that would catch on the edge of a character, are usually saved as the last steps. They add a whole nother level of pizzazz that without them, an image can look very flat. So I know from the beginning I would have normally opted for copious amounts of facial reference. How does this person look from this angle or from that angle? What about from, with this lighting or that lighting? to try to get build an understanding of their facial features but these boxes are an inch by an inch and a half or thereabouts there was going to be no way where i could fit the level of detail i'm used to putting into this stuff as quickly as it seemed to be coming together ultimately these boxes are one by one and a half inches approximately ultimately these boxes are too small for me able to be able to put in the amount of detail and the timeline in which we make kits is going to preclude that such a level of detail is moot because of how small our kit stickers are. Trying to put in that level of detail to make someone look like the character or the actor portraying said character is not a particularly worthwhile venture, not given the production timeline and production size make it really worth it to do that. So instead, I try to focus on the feeling of a given character. I think this was best illustrated by Bioexorcism, in which case the characters there seem to convey their personalities in the one box that I gave them. None of them look like the actors who portrayed them on the stage or in the films. Oh, I meant film and cartoon. So trying to get the feel of a character seems to be more important and personally more rewarding. I do still use faces, in particular for Mystic Mischief. I, I'm not crazy about how I portrayed Eddie Redmayne's character. There are elements where I'm unhappy about the final product, but only because I didn't have the same information when I made it as what I have right now. The part that took the most time would definitely be the shading. From, since I have to build it up from a dark gray to a light gray, near white, it takes time. I can't just jump from one solid sh Well, I can, but the approach is for a gradiated shading where the forms feel more rounded or real. Not realistic, just real. If that delineation makes any sense. I'd say that the toughest part to conceptualize would have to be the teacher, Professor Hicks. In drawing the Eulalie Hicks panel, the sides of the street around her were shot in a way and with quick cuts. I wasn't able to collect as much detail as I normally would want to, so I had to wing it and make up stuff, try to fill the space. I know that there are details that are wholly inaccurate, but I just didn't have access to what I needed to be able to fill in the, the background. 
so I had to make it up. And in making it up, I am, well, I'm not disappointed in the making up background. I'm disappointed in the, the final product because it doesn't feel like it has a narrative. It doesn't feel like it's making a statement. It just feels like it's there for the sake of being there. I mean, to me, and I'm criticizing my own artwork here, nobody else's. It is hard for me to describe the feeling that I have in knowing that someone had to go through any number of possible choices to be in a position to see us on one of our social medias or even as simple as just coming across one of our, our, our listings for our stickers. It's impossible to fathom what kind of decisions they made that led them there, but there was something in it that they saw that made them put it in their cart that allowed them to commit to it during checkout that they bought it and then typically within a few days have it in their hand sometimes my sister sends me videos of people talking about our kits and a lot of them have glowing things to say about my artwork and sure growing up i've always been told i've been talented or that i was good at drawing but those always seem to come from people I knew, even if it was that we were mere acquaintances through the fact that I drew. It always seemed to come from people who had a personal connection to me. So to hear it coming from perfect and complete strangers who have no idea about me, who I am as a person, how I spend my free time, <laughs> free time, that they know nothing about me and they still bought this stuff and then posted how they felt about my artwork is just so incredibly hard to describe. It is parts validation, parts pride, and also parts confoundedness, confusion. Admittedly, not as much confusion as pride and validation, but it's a really hard sensation to try to pin down. And I hate to say it because I don't feel like it's a particularly healthy form of motivation, but it does feel like it motivates me to continue working, to put something new and better out there each time.